uh, thanks everybody. I'm uh, here in Kamloops in front of the Wildfire uh, Emergency Center uh, for all of British Columbia. I'm with uh, the Minister Responsible for Public Safety and Emergency Management BC, Mike Farmworth, and the Minister Responsible for Forest Lands, Natural Resource, Resource Operations and Rural Development, Katrine Conroy. Uh, we were joined today by MLA Jackie Taggart, MLA for the region, and we did a flyover of a number of the fires that are our hot spots here in the Kamloops district, as well as going uh, to a flyover of uh, Lytton and then uh, stopped to speak to the crews on the ground in Lillooet. We did also take the opportunity to come back and look at, um, I think, a, a natural crisis that's been forgotten in the, all of the other issues of pandemic and fire season, and that was the, the slide at Big Bar, which had a profound impact on salmon two years ago. It was good to see the amount of work that's taken place there over the past two years, but still more work to do to restore those salmon runs to their, at least to, uh, uh, levels that we can hope that will keep them going forward into the future. It was a moving experience, I think, for all four of us uh, to fly over uh, Lytton and to see the devastation there, the damage of uh, a once vibrant, vibrant community at the, the coming together of the Fraser and the Thompson, uh, and to see uh, literally nothing left. Uh, on the other side of the river, however, there was hope. On the west side, there were homes or, and uh, farms and and other uh, activity and I'm confident that as we get to uh, through this initial crisis period and get back to the rebuilding that we know everyone in the community wants to see, uh, there will be a lot of hope because of the resilience of the Indigenous communities as well as those who live outside of the, uh, the Lytton town site. Having said that, uh, we couldn't help but be moved to talk to uh, firefighters in Lillooet uh, that live in Lytton, that their homes are now gone and yet they continue to be there for British Columbians uh, on the line, uh, fighting the fires uh, at McLean Creek, fighting the fires in, in and around Lytton, and, uh, and it just was inspiring. Uh, despite their personal loss, they remained uh, stoic and focused on the task at hand, working with people from around British Columbia who come together annually, regrettably, uh, in more uh, devastating circumstances over the past number of years to do what they can to push nature back when it comes to uh, fires that were ignited by uh, lightning and also to push back on those fires that may well have been human caused. Um, a deeply moving day for all three of us, uh, uh, but we're happy uh, that we had the opportunity to see firsthand and to talk to uh, uh, people on the ground and we're happy, I think, to take any questions you may have uh, at this time. There's on the phone line and then I have a couple of uh, reporters here. So if you have a question and you're near me, just raise your hand and I'll run the mic over to you. So our first question today is from Georgie Smith, CBC. Go ahead, Georgie. Or no, Georgie. <laughs> Keith? Keith Baldry. I think NL has a question. Do you want to ask it now while we sort yeah. out the phone line? Okay. I got a question for you, John. Sure. Hang on, you just have to use the mic. Oh. You have to say your name and raise. Sure. Chad Klassen from CFJC TV in Kamloops, talking to some ranchers in the Sparks Lake wildfire region, uh, Skeetchison and Deadman Valley, and and some other areas here in the, in the interior they're, they're frustrated with a, a lack of response from the bc wildfire service they're they're, they're fighting fires uh, basically on their own um, they did want me to ask why has a state of emergency not been declared well firstly we did uh, fly over uh, the sparks fires and there were uh, numerous plumes uh, throughout the valley uh, I know that the people behind me at the fire center are working uh, every minute of the day uh, to contain not just the fires there but right across the province and I'm confident that uh, they're doing everything that they can and of course people on the ground uh, have enormous challenges unimaginable uh, for those who are not living in the in the in the front line of a fire coming at your community so I have a great deal of uh, concern and I share that with them but I am confident that everything that can be done is being done from this center here in Kamloops I'll pass the mic to uh, Minister Farnworth to talk about the uh, the notice of uh, emergency uh, we have been as you will know in a state of emergency for over 14 months as a result of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And we're confident that every, every resource that can be mustered is being mustered. Uh, state of emergency is not required to do that, but I'll let Minister Farnworth explain how we come to those conclusions and where we go from here. 
Thank you. So in terms of uh, fighting the fires, uh, the wildfire service obviously takes the lead. Uh, they have the ability to access all the resources that they require in terms of personnel, for example. Uh, they're almost with contractors, over 2,700 uh, men and women fighting the fires right now in British Columbia. Uh, in terms of... Uh, of uh, help from the federal government. Uh, there's a, re a request for assistance that's already been approved, so federal resources are here. Uh, there are over 175 planes uh, in the air, uh, helicopters and aircraft uh, fighting the fires. Uh, in terms of when a provincial state of emergency is, is required, uh, that's based on the advice and the expertise of the men and women in the BC Wildfire Service uh, and Emergency Management BC. Uh, these are the men and women whose, whose job it is, and uh, their expertise is what uh, is what decides when it is time to put in place a, a provincial state of emergency, and uh, and they provide that that advice uh, regardless of which party or government is in power. Uh, and when they tell me that that's now time to move to that provincial state of emergency, that is when we do when we do it. It's not a political decision. It's not done on the basis of oh we need one. It is done on the basis of the advice of the men and women in the BC Wildfire Service. And I have every confidence uh, that when they uh, say it's time to to put one in place we will put one in place. Hi, Premier. Uh, Victor Kaiser with uh, Radio NL. Uh, just a question. I know the TNRD has uh, been pushing, I believe, the province for a backcountry uh, activities yeah. ban. Uh, the mayor of Lillooet as well told me today, or yesterday rather, that his biggest concern is lightning and, quoting him, people doing stupid things in the backcountry right now. Uh, we know on July 1st there was some fireworks set off in Kamloops when uh, our neighborhood was burning as well. So is that something that uh, you could be seeing happen, not just campfires and open burning, but also a restriction on backcountry activities. We, we met with the mayor of Lillooet today, and he was one of the first calls I made last week, and we took action immediately on backcountry activity in and around uh, that community and as well. Uh, throughout the region. Uh, you can't legislate against people doing stupid things, however, and lighting off fireworks uh, at this time uh, is uh, unimaginable to the vast majority of British Columbians, and no amount of policy is going to change that. But I'll ask Minister Conroy to talk about her role uh, responsible for backcountry and also working with industry on making sure that uh, when we get to that place where uh, there needs to be a cessation of all activity, where we step in and take that action. Uh, thank you, Premier. And, and so the BC Wildfire Services have declared um, any areas around the fire closed, any backcountry areas around the fire closed. We also utilize um, people that uh, work in the backcountry. Uh, we contract with them to help us uh, to put out the fires because they work there, they know the area, they know the, the country, and they know where they're going. So people might see um, loggers, for instance, people that are work in the forest industry out in the backcountry, they are actually on contract with uh, BC Wildfire Services uh, helping to fight the fires. So we're very aware, and, and where we need to um, close the backcountry, we have. You follow up? Uh, a follow up, uh, similar. Um, I'm not sure this might be putting you guys a little bit on the spot, but I know the, the city today, we had that fire in the Juniper neighborhood that uh, about 400 homes were threatened. Nothing was damaged, nothing was destroyed. Uh, the city's committing to uh, building a second access route, and I know there's been some talk from them to potentially contact the province to see if there's any way you can help out as well because we're looking at lots of residents with really only one way in and out and I'm sure there's lots of communities and lots of neighborhoods that might have similar questions for you if there's something you can do to help. Well, thank you for that. I, have, I haven't been contacted. Obviously, it's early days. Uh, but these are the types of things where communities need to come together. Uh, municipal governments, uh, both orders of government, the federal and the provincial government, indigenous communities. What I've been inspired by over the past uh, 14, 15 months is how we have all pull together to address the challenges of COVID-19. We're into yet another crisis, and I've seen, again, inspiring acts of courage. I've seen compassion. I've seen people reaching out to help each other. When examples of uh, administrative challenges in municipalities, uh, on reserve, within regional districts emerge, it's incumbent upon us all to talk to each other to find the best way forward. Uh, I will be meeting with the Prime Minister. I've spoken with the Prime Minister about the issues uh, uh, that have emerged since uh, Canada Day and the, the tragic loss of the town of Lytton and two fatalities. I'm going to be meeting with him later in the week. We'll talk about all of these issues. But I think what uh, makes Canada and British Columbia so uh, unique and special in, in the world is our ability to recognize and acknowledge where we can best work together. We stand ready to do that with the city of uh, 
Kamloops. We stand ready to work with anyone who has a, a plan that they want to want to work together on to, to make sure that citizens are safe and that we can move through the challenges, the multiple challenges we've had over the past couple of years to get back to a place that we can all hopefully call normal someday. Okay, we're going to take uh, Georgie again. Georgie Smith, CBC. No? Go ahead. Uh, Penny, there's been criticism on the ground in Britain today that not enough has been done to reduce the amount of potential fuel sources in forests and along highways to stop or slow the spread of forest fires. Is there financial assistance available to communities or private individuals to preemptively thin out wooded areas for fire protection? Well, uh, fire smart programs go on all, all year round. Uh, we had the privilege of talking to uh, uh, firefighters uh, from Lytton, the Rattlers, they're called. Uh, that's the name they give themselves, the, the, the men and women from Lytton that, that work not just in their own community but across British Columbia. And create, making communities fire safe is an ongoing process that we've been working on in British Columbia going back to the, the massive Kelowna fire back in uh, 2003. We have a lot more work to do. It seems that we uh, are, are always behind on these issues. And one of the things we talked about with frontline workers today was that very issue, that we can't let the winter months uh, be a time of dormancy. We need to take our opportunities when we're not out frontlining, fight, fighting the fires that are before us to make sure we can prevent those that may be coming in years ahead. Uh, so the, we're seized with that issue. Uh, the government of British Columbia has been for a number of years now, and we're going to redouble those efforts. This is the, uh, the third uh, fire season out of four or five that I've been uh, had the honour to be the Premier, where we have seen record numbers of fires. And it starts by making sure we're taking fuel away uh, so these sorts of things don't happen. That's a government responsibility. You mentioned private citizens. Uh, we're prepared to do that work as well, but that takes time to organise. We have a wildfire service that is uh, that is usually at, at play between, uh, in the case of the Lytton Rattlers, uh, from February to November. That leaves December and January to do that fuel, fuel removal. So we need to obviously do better, and we're going to do that. Follow-up, Georgie? Uh, yes, please. Um, Premier, you said you've flown over Lytton today. What can you tell us about what you've seen? And when will Lytton residents be allowed to um, see the damage for themselves? And is a tour bus being arranged? I, it is my understanding that the bus is being arranged. I'm looking over at the deputy and he's nodding at me. That's work underway. Uh, the concern, of course, was uh, toxic uh, elements uh, in, the, in the town site as a result of the fire. Uh, they're working to make sure, Wildfire Service and others are working to make sure that it is safe for people to come back and, and view the damage themselves. Uh, but it was quite, quite moving. Uh, the, uh, as I said, there was hope on the, on the west side of the river. Uh, communities remain intact, but the town site is virtually gone. Uh, the uh, rail bridge coming into uh, town is gnarled. Uh, and there's a lot of work to be done, but yet there were pockets uh, uh, where, uh, again, where fire smart activity had taken place and buildings are, are still standing. This is on the outside of the town site. But uh, as soon as it's safe, we want to get people back so they can start to, to bring closure to this most horrific of experiences for them and then start that uh, long road uh, to rebuilding. But the good news is people want to do that. The people that I've spoken to are anxious to get back uh, into town and start doing the work that they need to do to rebuild their community stronger than it was before, with a view to the future, with a view to building a community that is uh, representative of the challenges we have with climate change. Uh, Lytton had the highest temperature. It was hotter than Saudi Arabia, was what one of the firefighters said to me today, uh, last week. Uh, and that, uh, that is something that uh, we need to manage going forward. And the town of tomorrow will not be the town of the past. The community's ready for that, and the province stands ready to help them do that. Next question is from Keith Baldry, Global News. Uh, Premier, the, the heat wave exposed a number of, uh, a number of things, including the fact that on the West Coast we don't have air conditioning for the most part. We had many people presumably died in their homes where it was even warmer potentially than outside. Is it, given that this is probably not a once in a lifetime event and maybe a regular occurrence according to climate experts, are things like revisiting the building code when it comes to building things and install, installing mandatory cooling requirements that's something you're going to have to look at? 
Well, our, our Clean BC plan does envision the buildings of the future being, uh, you know, climate uh, friendly and, and ready to take on the challenges of a changing world. Uh, but that's going forward. We have, of course, uh, infrastructure and dwellings that are historic, uh, and we need to take time to figure out how we best address those issues. Uh, Minister Dix, who's not with us today, is already seized of those issues. Uh, public health is going to be working with the coroner service to take an assessment of what happened during the uh, the heat period uh, or the heat dome. Uh, we did have, of course, uh, engagement through the health authorities with uh, British Columbians that were already uh, connected in one way or the other, either through home care or some other uh, service provided by the province. But for those British Columbians who did not have any connection uh, to a, a government service, we couldn't determine what their condition was. Uh, 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 air conditioning, again, uh, as a born and raised British Columbian, a coastal British Columbian, something we never ever considered. In fact, even getting air conditioning in a car didn't seem uh, required, but now it's an essential. Uh, we're going to clearly have to change how we do business. And uh, the, the challenge for all of us as citizens is to take a look at what we've experienced over the past number of years and then take stock of how we prepare for those coming seasons. And that means, again, going back to the question uh, earlier question about making sure that we're reducing fuel in the interface, making sure that we're building in a different way. I think Lytton can be a case study for North America in how we build a community for the future. I'm excited about that and I know a number of citizens are as well. Keith, do you have a follow-up? Yes, I know hindsight is 2020, but in retrospect, do you think more could have been done to educate the public about a heat dome and a heat wave, the likes of which we've never, ever come close to seeing before, and the implications that, that are derived from it are something we were all so unfamiliar with. Well, I think you've just answered the question. We were unfamiliar with this. Uh, we didn't know what to expect. I mean, it's uh, forecasters were telling us that the temperatures were going to rise. Uh, we acknowledged that. Uh, and, and then we thought, well, it's June. We're almost into the summer. We did what normal human beings would do. We tried to absorb information that was foreign to us and continue on in our regular patterns. Well, the lesson we've learned is that this is not a, necessarily a one-time occurrence, and we now have to prepare for successive seasons like this. We have learned since the fires of 2017 and 2018 that this is the way of the future uh, in, uh, in our, our rural communities, those that are forested. We need to do that work to make them fire safe, and that work starts here in this facility with these employees and then branches out into regional districts, into municipalities, and into uh, indigenous communities as well. But uh, uh, hindsight, I don't have. Uh, I wish I did. And uh, we're going to have to work harder to make sure that we don't duplicate the, the experiences we've had over the past four years, whether it be uh, our management of a global pandemic, whether it be the floods that uh, we've had in the intervening years when we didn't have fires, uh, and then, of course, dealing with the challenges that we're seeing so graphically this week. Binder Sajjan, CTV. Being written, um, as you know, and for people are have almost nothing, just the clothes on their back. We've spoken to some who say they know that they have housing and food to eat for the next couple of days, but they're unsure about the medium term, what is going to happen. Obviously, rebuilding would be a long-term process, but what support can you commit to giving people in Lytton uh, who have virtually nothing left uh, over the medium term? I spoke with uh, a Lytton resident who uh, had uh, refuge in Vancouver. He's a recent resident, been in the community uh, 10, 15 years. He, by choice, he moved to the interior, something he always wanted to do. I saw him on a television clip uh, leaving town with flames all around him, and I was so impressed with how uh, grounded he was leaving a crisis. And I phoned him up a couple of days ago, and we had a good chat about, uh, about how he felt and where he was going. and we. we remarked that he had the shoes on his feet and the shirt on his back and you know I don't know if anyone has ever really contemplated what that means uh, but here was an individual uh, who was facing that square on that he was happy to be alive he was happy to have comfort uh, and solace with friends and he was going to put his mind to uh, where am I going to get another pair of pants where am I going to do these basic things and these are basic things it's not about 
Uh, when am I going to get back into my condo? When am I going to... Some of the challenges that we oftentimes say are, are enormous challenges in our lives. These are individuals that have nothing but the clothes on their backs. And our commitment collectively, not just as a government, but as a province, is to do what we can to help. And we've seen overwhelming support from communities right across the province. I was speaking to the MLA from Abbotsford the other day and the volume of clothing and food and money that's being raised in Abbotsford to help the people of Lytton is, is almost record breaking. I'm confident that we'll be able to coordinate all that. I'll pass it on to Minister Farnworth because the emergency social services elements are, are his responsibility in this setting, but we're prepared to do whatever we can. And the good news is that British Columbians are right behind us on that. Thank you, Binder. So emergency services kicks in right from the moment the, uh, the disaster takes place and is there to support people right through uh, until they can start to get back on their feet. Um, we've got, they have incredible experience from, uh, from other previous fires and previous years and floods in terms of finding accommodation, supporting people in the accommodation that they're going to need, uh, whether it's for a single individual, whether it's for people with families, ensuring that they are, you know, the food supports uh, and the ability to access the services that, that, that they require. So emergency services will be on the job, not just for a few days, but for quite some time to come. Ender, follow up. Yeah, and um, just looking back to the 2017 fire season, I know there was an announcement of uh, millions of dollars and work with the Red Cross. Um, are we just not at that point yet, or why have, hasn't the province announced a fund to help people? I know you've spoken about the fundraising that individuals are doing on their own. Oh, I'm messing with the microphone. Sorry, uh, Binder. Uh, that, that investment in 2017 did not get fully subscribed. The, uh, the Red Cross still has those resources, and they've come, uh, come into play in, in previous years as well. We're going to be working with all providers to make sure that the resources are there. Uh, we have been doing, uh, again, we're now, uh, the, the three of us are four years into this uh, exercise of uh, uh, working within governments and we uh, know more now than we did then and we're going to be able to make sure that we move resources more effectively than we did in those first few weeks back in 2017. Uh, but I'm confident that the Red Cross is at the ready as they always are to step in and we do have the resources. Again, uh, Minister Farmworth, uh, Minister Conroy and I are all uh, committed to making sure that those resources uh, leave government and get into the hands of people so they can do uh, the work that needs to happen. This is a massive undertaking in, in Lytton, to be sure, and I want to remind people it's the first week in July and we have a long summer ahead of us. Uh, we're not under any illusion that the crisis has passed. We are in it and we're going to keep uh, working as hard as we can to keep people safe. Uh, the Sparks Fire is a good example. Uh, there are fires emerging. Uh, we saw one, uh, we called one in uh, on the flight back that was not yet on the board. And if you go into this center where uh, dedicated uh, uh, public servants are working hour after hour after hour to coordinate uh, tactical operations across the province and also be ready to assist in the Yukon or in Alberta or in Washington State. And uh, this is really an extraordinary undertaking that goes on in this place and the people in there make it happen. Again, the federal government, as Minister Farnworth has said, has already started to deploy resources. I'll be talking again to the Prime Minister. Uh, I think we're in good shape in terms of collaboration. There are those moments where communication falls, falls apart, whether it be with a regional district, a local council, uh, an indigenous council, whatever it might be. We always have to redouble our efforts, but this is an across ministry effort on our part. All ministers who have a, a connection to delivering services to people are engaged in this, and we're going to keep doing that till we get through this fire season and into the fall. Quest no, next question is from James Keller, Globe and Mail. Hi, Premier. Um, we've heard concerns from the Lytton First Nation and the Tribal Council that represents them and several others who have concerns about the province's handling of the evacuation and the subsequent relief efforts. You know, the issues include poor communication, uh, inadequate resources uh, in the past week or so. And uh, they're also concerned about the resumption of rail service through their communities. So I'm just wondering if you can respond to these complaints and just tell me what the provincial government is doing uh, to address them. 
Well, I uh, reached out immediately to the leadership of the Lytton First Nation. Uh, extraordinary uh, acting uh, chief uh, John Hogan uh, was talking to me on the phone while he was uh, directing activities in his community. Uh, this was early days. Uh, I met with his nephew today on the fire lines uh, who was out. His home is gone, but he is on the fire lines uh, uh, working to protect other people. Uh, these, these are always challenging times. The communication has been as direct and candid as it can be. Uh, I don't want people to hold back. Uh, I know that uh, some leaders have been uh, harsh. Uh, we've reached out uh, and continue to reach out to them and we're going to do the best we can. It's a crisis situation. People are going to be unhappy. I get that and it's not personal. It's not uh, a failure of the government. It's a failure in a time of great stress and anxiety. There's no fault to be apportioned. The resources are there. Uh, they'll continue to flow. Uh, with respect to the evacuation, it was minutes, minutes. I talked to the mayor uh, and he was literally uh, smelling smoke uh, and 15 minutes later the town was ablaze. You don't have a lot of warning in those circumstances. With respect to the cause of the fire, that's currently under investigation. We'll have more to say once that investigation is completed. James, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, uh, we've heard from several members of the Tribal Council who are talking about the potential for rail blockades if some of their concerns, including with rail traffic, but also some of the other issues I mentioned, aren't addressed. Uh, what are you doing to ensure it doesn't come to that? Well, again, uh, with respect to communication and delivering services, which is our responsibility, we'll continue to do that. Uh, the federal government uh, and Transport Canada is responsible for the railway. Uh, they're the primary uh, de decision makers in this instance, and uh, I'll leave it to them to speak uh, uh, on behalf of uh, the rail operations. Uh, I'm confident that we can find a way forward. Uh, there are representatives from uh, CN and CP who are now uh, being allowed by the Regional District and the Lytton First Nation to uh, uh, observe uh, and uh, review the, the damage that's been done there. The, the site has been secured. Uh, by those that are doing the investigations, and I'll have more to say uh, when that, once that work is complete. Next question is from Marcella Bernardo, News 1130. Hi, Premier. I'm hoping, I don't know if you said this right at the beginning, but is it possible to get an update on anyone else who may have died in, the, in this fire? Because at last count, we had that two, two lives have been lost, and we haven't been given any kind of update about whether anyone else may have perished. Marcella, I'm not aware of any others. I've not been briefed on any other fatalities other than the two that were announced uh, uh, recently. Uh, and we're, uh, again, the, uh, the, the, the town site is clear. Uh, they're working uh, with uh, concerns about toxicity at this point, uh, but neighbors and, and uh, mem family members and community members will be able to access uh, the community shortly. Uh, that'll be overseen uh, by the wildfire service uh, and uh, again, it's going to be a traumatic experience for people. I, I know, again, I, I, I hearken back to those uh, uh, brave men and women who uh, live in Lytton but were not home uh, when the fire struck because they were elsewhere protecting other people. And their stories are, are moving, and I'll leave it to them to uh, tell them if they choose to. Follow up, Marcella. Just hoping to get some more clarity from you on, on the... What, what seemed to be a perfect storm last week of the pandemic and the heat wave and the fires and, and everything that's happening now with BC Emergency Services and what we need to know moving forward about will these resources be there for us when we need them? When somebody calls 911, will they have to wait more than five minutes to get help? Um, well, there's a, there's a lot in that question. And I know that uh, learnings are, are always uh, valuable. Uh, I know that uh, the issues around the, the heat dome in the lower mainland and accessing uh, emergency services is being reviewed. Uh, Minister Dix is uh, working on that. Uh, the coroner's service is working on that. Public health is working on that as well. Uh, it was a convergence of a whole host of issues at the same time without any doubt. Again, uh, we were uh, a bit jolly on uh, Tuesday, I have to say, uh, Dr. Henry, Minister Dix and I, and Minister Farnworth, who, who was overseeing this longest ever state of emergency, uh, we were a bit giddy at the prospect of uh, saying goodbye to the emergency and, and uh, uh, stepping, of course, into the third step of our, uh, our restart plan. So uh, it came, uh, and, and the, the prospect of hotter weather 
again, uh, we didn't think of it as catastrophic hotter weather. We thought of it as hotter weather, and I don't think there are too many people that didn't. Uh, warnings were there, to be sure, and uh, we did our best under the circumstances. The health authorities had plans in place. They, uh, they acted upon those. That's been pretty clear. Emergency services, uh, emergency health services uh, were not able to meet the volumes, which are at record highs, by the way. Uh, people uh, getting out and doing more were uh, becoming injured, uh, accessing emergency services. All of those challenges, as you say, were a perfect storm. But uh, uh, in terms of uh, rebuilding uh, throughout the system, uh, that's our job. And government is about dealing with what's in front of you and making the best choices possible for the greatest number of people. That's been our passion and mission from the beginning. It has been an awful lot of challenges, I have to say. And uh, we continue to do our best to meet those challenges as they emerge. We have time for one more question. Bill Fortier, CTV. Hi, Premier. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, you mentioned getting resources to the people who got out of town with only the shirts on their backs. So I'm curious, it, you know, following the wildfires that, you know, devastated Slave Lake, Alberta, and Fort McMurray, Alberta, the province provided uh, direct financial support in the form of prepaid credit cards. Because I, I know you're providing, you know, food and uh, accommodations, but some of these people don't even have toothpaste or toothbrushes. Are, is your government going to look at providing cash to these people to help them buy the necessities they need right now? I'll pass that to Minister Farnworth to answer. Thanks. Uh, thank you uh, for that question. One of the, uh, the significant changes that took place since the 2017 wildfires was to move from a paper-based uh, registration system to a digital registration system, which allows for much greater access and ability to provide exactly the kind of resources and support that individuals need. Because when you register, it's like how many kids you have, uh, what's your current situation. And one of the areas in which we do are able to provide support is through the example, is through, for example, through, uh, through uh, uh, um, um, debit cards, uh, prepaid cards that allow you to get the kind of supplies uh, that you may need, uh, the kinds of, uh, uh, whether it's toothpaste, for example, or, or, or groceries or however. Uh, so that is the kind of uh, support that we are able to and do, do provide. Bill, do you have a follow-up? Just, just for clarification uh, from Minister Farnworth, are you saying that is being provided? Because we've spoken to a number of evacuees who have asked for that and say they're not getting that. Those, those are the kinds of things that are provided. Um, you know, initially, people do have to, to have to register. The supports are there. Emergency Management BC and, so, and Emergency Social Services have the ability and the resources to provide the supports that people need. That's all the time we have. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thanks, everybody.